Welcome. Thank you all for tuning in to this Cato Institute Book Forum. Today we'll be discussing a timely and accessible work of moral philosophy titled Grandstanding, The Use and Abuse of Moral Talk. Released in print today, this book examines speakers' use of moral language to draw attention to their own purported moral superiority and illustrates how the self-aggrandizing use of moral talk damages our public conversations. Libertarianism.org's Aaron Powell and I are joined by the book's authors, Justin Tosi and Brandon Warmke. Justin Tosi is an assistant professor of philosophy at Texas Tech University, specializing in political, legal, and moral philosophy. Brandon Warmke is an assistant professor of philosophy at Bowling Green State University, and he specializes in ethics, moral psychology, and social philosophy. We will be taking audience questions online using the hashtag Cato events hashtag. So if you have a question for the authors, whether you're watching this event via Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or the Cato Institute website, post it with the Cato events hashtag so our question queuing software can find it. Justin, Brandon, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, great to be to here. To begin, oh, to begin, Briefly, what is grandstanding? So uh, if you want the simplest sort of uh, bumper sticker description of, of grandstanding, it's uh, using discussion of morality or politics and public discourse as a vanity project. Grandstanders use discussions of uh, morality, justice, talk of rights, uh, family values, tradition, uh, to draw attention to themselves, to make themselves look like moral paragons. They, they want others to think of them as morally enlightened or caring more about the poor or caring more about the American factory worker. Um, if you want something a little bit more detailed, the account of grandstanding we give in the book is a, is a very simple one. We say that grandstanding simply has two parts. Um, the first part is that grandstanders want a certain audience, uh, their reference network to think certain things about them. They want them to come to believe that uh, they have certain impressive moral properties. We call this the, the recognition desire. So grandstanders want to be recognized um, as having certain moral qualities by, by certain people in the audience. The second part of the, of the account is that the grandstanders say something. Uh, and they say something because they want to impress people. And we call the, the thing that they say, what they type into Facebook or Twitter, or what they say on cable news or in a stump speech, if it's a politician, uh, that thing they say is what we call the grandstanding expression. And that grandstanding expression is motivated in a significant way by this desire for, uh, for praise uh, to be seen as on the side of the angels. Uh, and so grandstanding is a very simple thing. It's, it's these two parts. You can think of it in terms of an equation. Grandstanding uh, just is uh, saying something in public discourse with a primary or significant motivation uh, to be seen as morally impressive. What's the difference between grandstanding and another term that gets thrown around a lot, virtue signaling? Good question. Uh, so let me focus on two differences. Um, but first I'll say these are related terms. Uh, I think that often when people talk about virtue signaling, they could just as well be talking about grandstanding. Uh, but Nonetheless, uh, Brandon and I think that virtue signaling uh, is not an ideal term for capturing uh, what's going wrong uh, when people use moral talk in the way that we describe. Uh, so one reason for this is that a lot of grandstanding is not about virtue. Uh, virtue is typically thought to be an excellence of character. Um, but a lot of grandstanding is just about showing people that you're decent enough, right? So you, you might say, look, I've made a lot of mistakes in, in my life, uh, but even I know you don't treat women that way. So when someone says that, they are trying to show people that they have certain moral qualities and, and they want at least to be thought of as, as a good person, uh, but they're not trying to claim any 
virtue for themselves. Uh, the other problem is, is maybe more serious, uh, and it's that signaling is overbroad uh, as, as a category to pick out uh, the right kinds of, of uh, expressions. Uh, so you send a signal anytime you talk about morality at all. Right? So if you make any moral claim at all, you're signaling to people that, that you probably believe that thing, that you may be committed to it in, in certain ways. But we don't object to every single instance of moral communication. What people are complaining about when they complain about grandstanding or, or about virtue signaling typically uh, is that people are using moral talk for the wrong reason. They're using it to impress others, and they're doing so intentionally. Uh, so we think that grandstanding uh, is sort of a, a narrower term, uh, and it picks out uh, the the right uh, instances of the use of moral talk to complain about. Yeah, I just want to add uh, uh, to, to Justin's comments there. I mean, when we started writing about uh, grandstanding in 2014, uh, the term virtue signaling wasn't really on the scene. I mean, uh, we, we started writing, uh, it was about a year after, I think, uh, the, the term virtue signaling started picking up um, uh, online in, in, uh, in sort of public discussions as a term to pick out this sort of showy, ostentatious moral behavior. Uh, and, you know, as, as Justin mentioned, there's just lots of reasons why we think it's um, it's not the most helpful terminology to pick out a, a, a discussion of, of, um, of self-involved, egoistic moral talk um, for all the reasons he mentions. Also, the, you know, the term has been picked up um, in the in the culture wars. So, I, you know, virtue signaling as a term tends to be tends to connote, uh, you know, a complaint from the political right against the political left. But um, all the research that we've done over, over um, seven studies and 6,000 participants, um, all the evidence we have is that grandstanding is uh, equally uh, bipartisan. People on the left do it just as much as people on the right, although, as we found, people on the ideological extremes do it much more. Um, so because the term has gotten caught up in the culture wars, we, you know, we think it's, it's, it's best to avoid. Um, and also that, you know, the term itself is a bit ambiguous as Justin notes. I mean, um, I think what most people have in mind with virtue signaling when they accuse someone of doing it is they're accusing someone of, of basically grandstanding of using someone, uh, of, of, of using moral talk for, for self-promotion or vain purposes and that sort of thing. But there's a perfectly, as Justin knows, there's a perfectly innocent use of the term virtue signaling too, which is like whenever you do something virtuous in public, whether you're trying to impress people or not, that's, that sends a signal. And so there's a kind of equivocation or confusion that can result. And this is, you know, one way you see this is now we have this discussion you may have seen of, of vice signaling. So there's like these... Or arguments about whether someone's virtue signaling or vice signaling. So we think grandstanding is just a, it's a much clearer term. It's a term that dates back to the 19th century. Uh, it, it, it came out of um, a 1988 book, or excuse me, an 1888 book on, on, on baseball. And the idea was that these, these guys who are in the outfield making really showy catches and playing to the, to the crowd, they were playing to the grandstands. And so we think it captures a very intentional um, uh, use of, of moral talk for self-promotion in a way that, that virtue signaling kind of obscures. So the, the idea of virtue signaling is broader and can capture nonverbal behaviors, choices, decisions that may not be made for political or grandstanding purposes. Perhaps someone really just does like the Prius. But in picking up grandstanding, you've chosen to focus specifically on moral talk, conversation. Why that focus on speech? Well, we think that uh, that public discourse is an extremely valuable tool. So it's it's our primary method as human beings to communicate that someone's been wronged, to identify injustices, to warn of threats, to to praise people who are worthy of trust. Um, public discourse is an extremely valuable tool for improve, for improving the world. Um, 
It's also a very scarce resource. It's also a very fragile tool. It's easy to abuse. It's, it's easy to take for granted. And, um, and so we think that this really valuable tool, you might think that people would naturally want to take, take, you know, take care of this and, and preserve it and use it for appropriate purposes. Um, but it turns out you can also abuse this resource. You know, it's, it's like a resource in the commons. It's like a pasture. It's like a public park. I mean, it can be used and it can be abused. It can be used for, um, for proper ends and it can be used for other, other kinds of nefarious purposes. And in our view, grandstanding is one of those uh, uses of moral talk that actually degrades the social currency. It degrades our ability to have uh, conversations with each other about what matters. Um, grandstanders uh, find a way to turn these discussions of really important problems into discussions about themselves. And so we think that um, our focus on public conversation and given the rise of social media and how many conversations are occurring now, uh, we think that it's the time to have a conversation about how we converse. Uh, just to, to chime in a, a couple of more quick things. Um, one reason to focus on, on speech rather than also uh, to bring a lot of action into the conversation uh, is that I think it, it's reasonable to say the stakes change a lot when you start talking about action uh, because, you know, say someone gives $100 million to, to some hospital for, for cancer research or something like that, uh, we might not care as much if, if the person does so partly out of vanity and, you know, they want a wing named after themselves uh, because the amount of good that they do is so much greater uh, than the amount of good you, you might do simply by, by saying something or even, even giving a, you know, a fairly major speech. Uh, Another reason to focus just on speech in, instead of action uh, is that the model for what we're trying to do here is to, to give uh, an account of a certain kind of speech act. Uh, so if you read the book, uh, uh, Will, you probably notice we go again and again to comparisons to lying. Um, so you know, if you wanted to focus on like dishonesty, you could talk about all sorts of dishonest actions. Um, dishonesty and in, in, in lots of forms of expression and lots of different areas of life. Um, but you learn a lot uh, by just talking about the case of, of dishonest speech, um, you know, int intentionally mis misleading speech. Uh, so we took that as, as sort of a model for proceeding and, and uh, we hope that, uh, that what we ended up doing shed, shed a lot of light on the use of moral talk for self-promotion. The Kind of the core of the book is this chapter where you set out a taxonomy of grandstanding, which I think was was for me just a deeply interesting section because a lot of us a lot of us have a sense of what this grandstanding thing is, even if we call it virtue signaling or whatever else. But but the the separating it out is is really clarifying. So I was hoping maybe you guys could run through that taxonomy a bit, those, those different kinds of grandstanding, the way that people go about doing it. Sure. Yeah. This is, uh, this is one of our favorite parts of the book, uh, is we, we run through what we call a field guide of, of grandstanding. Now, one thing to note at the outset is that there's no foolproof test for identifying <laughs> when someone is grandstanding. I mean, we, we talk about grandstanding a lot with people over the past few years. And one of the first questions we often get is, well, tell me, tell me what grandstanding looks like. Tell me how I can identify grandstanders. I think often because they want to go out on Facebook or Twitter and just start calling people grandstanders or something like that. Um, later in the book, we argue that's not the way to go about solving this problem. But it can be helpful to have a, a roadmap or a field guide about what what kinds of discourse um, tend to exemplify grandstanding. So I'll, I'll just quickly run through um, each of the five here. So one of them we call piling on. So piling on involves uh, saying something that other people have said to get on to get in on the action, just to show that your heart is on the right place. And the and the primary motivation here is just to um, show that you're one of the good guys, to show that you're, or at least that you want other people to think that that you share their values. Uh, so people who um, engage in these huge uh, shaming pylons, for example. 
There's research that shows that people engage in these activities, not necessarily because they believe someone actually did something wrong, but because they want to be seen as having certain kinds of values. Uh, they want to be seen as tough on the, the out group and so on. And so a lot of grandstanding involves this sort of pile on of, of people joining with others just to be seen as taking a certain stance, whether they believe that stance or not. Uh, a second form of grandstanding uh, is what we call uh, ramping up. And ramping up is when moral discourse takes the form of an arms race. So we know from social psychology that a, a lot of the way that we think of ourselves is in terms of how we match up to others, how we think about ourselves in relation to others. And so um, what happens in public discourse is if I think of myself as caring deeply for the poor or caring deeply for the American factory worker, and someone in public discourse says something that implies that they care deeply, I have a choice to make. I can allow them to be seen as really important and really impressive uh, and caring deeply for these things, perhaps more than I care, or I can try to outdo them. And so uh, there's lots of examples of this in recent discourse. You know, we went from you know, police need uh, serious reform to abolish the police in about two days. We went from masks don't help and uh, to if you wear a mask, you're part of the deep state in about two days. And so there's this sort of competition that that can occur in public discourse where people are trying to outdo each other to take a more uh, extreme or um, demanding position to show how much they care or show how much uh, how sensitive they are about these certain moral considerations. Uh, a third form of uh, the grandstanding can take is what we call trumping up. Trumping up, um, no, no relation to the current president, by the way. Uh, trumping up has to do with trumping up charges. So you take a, a morally innocent piece of behavior or maybe a slight moral wrong and you trump up the charges. You make it something really big or really important, something morally egregious. And what that signals to others is that you have a really sensitive moral compass uh, that you are um, intolerant of any moral behavior. And so a lot of, a lot of grandstanding involves taking very innocent morally behavior and, and moralizing it, running it through this machine that makes it this really huge problem so that others can see how impressive you are. Um, grandstanding also takes the form of, uh, of excessive emotions, often um, in, the, in, in terms of outrage. So we know that from, from psychology that expressions of outrage signify your moral convictions. If you get really outraged about something, that implies that you care deeply about it and you have lots of moral convictions. Um, and so grandstanders can exploit this background assumption and get outraged about all kinds of things. Um, I mean, we know from, from psychology that, that people get outraged to alleviate guilt. We know they do it to, uh, to uh, avoid suspicion about their own bad behavior. And one, one other thing they do is they, they use outrage to, to show how much they care and show how, much, uh, how morally impressive they are in public discourse. Um, and then finally, uh, the f final form that grandstanding can take is what we call dismissiveness. So someone might say something like, you know, if you can't see that this, that Hamilton, the musical is the most, um, you know, egregious, morally egregious thing that's ever been produced on Broadway, then I don't have time for you. Let's not talk anymore, you know, do better, right? And so a lot of, a lot of grandstanding involves this sort of very dismissive attitude towards people. Um, and the implication is that I don't need to explain why this is wrong. And even if I were to explain it, you wouldn't understand it and you wouldn't appreciate the moral gravity of it. So these are the five forms that, that grandstanding can take. They aren't meant to be exhaustive, but we do think they shed a light on um, the ways that grandstanding tends to rear its ugly head in public discourse. So let me just bookend that answer, uh, by re-emphasizing something that Brandon said at the outset. Uh, and that is that uh, this is not like a guide to actually spotting instances of, of grandstanding in the world. Uh, so you can grandstand, as, as Brandon just said, without doing any of, any of those five things. Uh, and you can do any of those five things without grandstanding. Uh, so the point of giving this guide is just to help people understand uh, what this account can explain uh, and uh, to help them, them see that uh, if, if grandstanding is common, they should expect to see a lot of this behavior. As you were going through these, um, 
the thing that occurred to me is, so your your definition of grandstanding has almost like a mens rea requirement that it's, you have to have the intent to do it. You're trying to use moral talk to accomplish something. And it seems that a number of the kinds of grandstanding we might see not so much as, or not necessarily as trying to get other people to think a certain way of as you, but just in terms of it feels good to do these things. Like sometimes it just feels mm -hmm. good to get outraged or it feels good to pile on because it makes you feel righteous and better about yourself. Is that, is that a distinct sort of behavior or thing, but just like your audience is yourself? Yeah, that's a nice question. So uh, I don't think there's one a one size fits all answer to that question. I, I think you're absolutely right that a lot of people engage in these behaviors uh, like excessive outrage and uh, sort of dom domineering uh, public discourse but simply because it feels good. Um, they're exercising what Nietzsche called their will to power. They they just really enjoy dominating other people. It gives them satisfaction. I don't think you have to be grandstanding to do that. I mean, our, our view is not that, you know, grandstanding is the only uh, poison in public discourse. I, I think there's surely lots of lots of behavior that's um, engaged in simply because it feels good. There's a couple of philosophers, T. Nguyen and Becca Williams have this really nice paper uh, um, called Moral Outrage Porn. And the idea is that a lot of people use moral outrage uh, to kind of satisfy their desires and, and make themselves feel good. Now, all that being said, I do think that one reason why these things feel good to us is because they reaffirm to ourselves how good we think we are. I mean, uh, decades of research show that most people think they're morally better than the average person. Um, we all give ourselves pretty high grades, morally speaking. Um, and uh, we typically want others to believe those things about us too. And so it feels good to have these, um, these visions of ourselves reaffirmed in public. And so I think you're right that, you know, it's not just the only audience is not just the other person, you know, reading my posts online or, you know, if I'm a cable talk show host, you know, what, what people say about me on Twitter afterwards. That isn't the only audience. We are also, I think, our own audience sometimes. And so sometimes I think we're sort of playing to ourselves to convince ourselves or reassure ourselves that we're as good as we think we are. Yeah, just to add, um, so we recognize, of course, that, that motivation is really complicated. People ne almost never uh, act out of just one pure motivation. Uh, but I just want to point out, um, even if we are often uh, acting you know, because it feels good, uh, or if, if we're uh, trying to satisfy our will to power, as, as Brandon points out, uh, we might also be trying to promote our social status. Uh, so you might think um, when someone you know, goes after somebody publicly just, just to feel good, uh, they're also trying to, to show people, look, I, I'm someone to be reckoned with. Uh, I am not you know, someone that you should uh, you should go after, uh, I should be deferred to. And this can be another way of raising your status within your group uh, because you know, people might think, okay, you know, this guy, Brooks, no bullshit, right? Uh, you, you don't mess with him. Um, this is a friend I wanna have uh, and so on. So taking this, this sort of mens rea element, um, how should we distinguish grandstanding from attempts to lead by example um, when you genuinely feel that you can act as as a moral guide for others um, and that by demonstrating the correct course of action um, in your personal life others will follow on yeah that's good so you know, as Justin mentioned, the motivations for our behavior are complex and myriad. Uh, but here's a simple way to think about um, the different ways that we might be motivated to engage in public discourse. So one broad category of motivations we have might be altruistic, right? So we engage in public discourse. We say what we say 
because um, we truly care about other people. We're trying to help. We're trying to um, say something that will promote understanding, that will promote uh, under, uh, seeking the truth, will evidence. Uh, you're saying things, you know, because you have some really good reason to think this is going to be helpful. Okay. That's one kind of motivation you could have. I think those are uh, perfectly innocent and laudable motivations to have in a public discourse. Another reason, another kind of motivation, a family of motivations you might have, or what we call maybe dutiful motivations, having to do with duty. So maybe you're not so much trying to help, but you're trying to promote or articulate the moral truths. You're trying your best to give reasons or evidence to discover you know, what we ought to do or what we ought to do together. And I think those are perfectly uh, laudable, virtuous motivations for discourse too. The, the, the third category of motivations is, is the category that I think causes lots of trouble. And those are egoistic motivations. Those are motivations to engage in discourse um, for self-interested reasons, right? And, and the reasons that we primarily are interested in in this book are reasons having to do with social status. And, um, and so our worry is that, you know, when you engage in public discourse for egoistic reasons, for self-serving reasons, that, that's, that doesn't just hold constant what you say. It's actually going to motivate and cause you to say things that you wouldn't otherwise say and do things you wouldn't otherwise do if you weren't, if you weren't selfishly motivated. And so for lots of reasons we go into the, um, that we discuss in the book, egoistic motivations in public discourse cause all kinds of problems. They, they lead to polarization. It leads to cynicism about public discourse. It causes outrage exhaustion. And then, you know, it, it's also just disrespectful. It, it, it treats people as mere means, right? Uh, simply, you know, conscripting them into your morality play to show people how good you are. Um, it, you know, using discourse for these purposes, free rides on other people's um, well-intentioned uses of public discourse. Uh, and, and also, we just think that using public discourse in these selfish, egoistic ways, um, you know, one way that Nietzsche might put it, it's just, it's just pathetic. That's, that's, that's not what morality is for. Morality is not to try to gain social status. It's not there to try to impress people. The point of morality is not to dominate people and shame them and make them cower before you. That's a, that's a cheap, pathetic way to use morality. That's not what morality is for. And so for all those reasons, we think that egoistic um, egoistically motivated public discourse is just going to lead to a lot of the problems we see. I mean, it's sort of, our case is made easier if you look at public discourse. I mean, no one thinks it's going well. Uh, I think we all think it could be going better. And what we would uh, counsel people is to think about how they're, how they're contributing. Are they engaging in discourse for altruistic reasons or dutiful reasons? Um, and one way to, you know, simply test that of ourselves is just to ask, you know, before we <laughs> type into Twitter or on Facebook or something, just ask ourselves, am I doing this because um, uh, I want to look good or am I doing this because I actually think it's going to do good? And we think that that sort of question is the kind of question we should be asking before we engage in discourse. I think if a lot of us try to imagine examples of grandstanding, many of the ones we're going to come up with, if not mm -hmm. most of them, will be in the political sphere, that it, it seems that people grandstand quite a lot on political issues. And so I'm curious about the relationship between politics and grandstanding. If on the one hand, is it is it easy, is it easier to grandstand about political issues or in our current environment, you just get, you know, more engagement if you grandstand on political issues and other issues? Or is there perhaps a, the causation runs in the other direction that the, the kinds of issues that we tend to grandstand on are the ones that then become politicized? Like the, the kind of moral outrage leads us to wanting to politicize, say, the outcome of those issues. Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of different ways I could take that. Um, so one thing that, that people expect us to do in this book that we don't do uh, is to really go after politicians. Uh, because when you think of grandstanding, 
the first things that you think of are, are probably politicians engaging in to demand it, uh, right? So here's the great thing about uh, political actors in, in a democracy. They, ba they tend to basically give us what we want, right? So why do politicians grandstand? Because they're rewarded for it. Uh, so politicians face uh, incentives that the rest of us, I mean, you know, our friends will sort of like our posts, maybe sometimes if we say things that, that are, are pleasing to them, uh, but our livelihood generally does not depend on uh, the people around us uh, or, you know, our supporters, if, if you really want to think of it that way. Uh, it doesn't depend on, on whether they uh, think that we are, are good, upstanding people. Um, this causes a lot of problems, though. In politics, and, and there's good reason for us to stop uh, demanding that, that politicians uh, engage in, in these sort of uh, attention-grabbing uses of, of moral talk. Uh, one problem is that uh, because we encourage our, our politicians to take moralized stances, uh, we see fewer cases of important compromise. Uh, so why is that? Uh, well, because if someone takes a moral stance on an issue because you know they, they take that person to have been committed to that stance. Um, by the same token, we expect uh, you know politicians to, to be loyal to us. All right. So we don't like it, uh, at least the very partisan among us don't like it uh, when they give in to the other side, right? Because that just makes it look like, again, they're going back on their moral commitments. So politicians have, have every incentive uh, not to compromise. Another problem uh, is that when we turn politics into a morality pageant, um, that's basically what we get. We get uh, just a display of, of everyone's good intentions instead of policies that work. So Brandon and I call this the expressive policy problem. So take rent control, for instance. Uh, basically, every economist agrees that rent control doesn't work. It just causes housing shortages. It doesn't make housing more affordable. Uh, and yet, politicians, many of whom must know this, uh, continue to call for introducing rent control measures. Why do they do that? Uh, because on the face of it, it looks like these policies will promote some morally worthy goal that is making it easier for people to have a home. So, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought for, for just a second there. Um, so why do they do this? Well, because it's a lot easier to give people what they want by proposing these you know, morally splashy policies than it is to, to sit them down and explain to them, no, look, you, know, you need to understand supply and demand, how, how markets work. No, of course, no one wants to listen to that. Um, they have their slogan about you know, how everyone deserves housing as a, a matter of basic fairness. Uh, and so uh, because the issue is so thoroughly moralized and there's so much grandstanding about it, we get policies that sound good and don't work. And that it's really easy for most people to see grandstanding on the other side, as it were. Uh, it's easy to see pol to grandstanding politicians, egoistically motivated politicians on the other side. But everyone, I mean, every politician does it. And I, I think we, we just have to be honest that people, even our beloved, if there are beloved politicians, even our beloved politicians on our own side are, are doing this. And they do it, as Justin points out. Because we want it, right? We want them to affirm our values. Study after study shows that people vote because they think someone shares their values or, um, or uh, cares about them. And those are all well and fine. Uh, but the problem is when politicians, as Justin point out, it, uh, support and propose policies merely because they express those, those values, not because they're actually going to. In thinking about the prevalence of grandstanding today, is there a technological aspect to its seeming widespread nature? Do we just have more avenues to broadcast our purported virtues or a greater ability perhaps to curate how we present ourselves to the world? Um, or has this all been kind 
kind of going on for a long time and maybe it was just less visible. Yeah. So we, we argue in the book that the ingredients, the basic human ingredients for grandstanding are as old as, uh, society. Um, uh, and the desire to impress people, the desire for status, those, those very basic human desires have been with us. I mean, in many aspects of life, we're able to overcome those desires. I mean, you might be at a d dinner party and you really want people to know how much you make, uh, or where you went to college, you know, but you're able to sort of overcome those temptations and, and just keep your mouth shut. Um, so those, those motivations, those features of human psychology have been with us a long time. So we don't think there's, there's anything sort of intrinsically unique about the present moment. What is different is that at no time in human history have people been able to just get on their phones and immediately talk to hundreds or thousands or even millions of people. And for a lot of human beings, that's just, that temptation, the temptation to get the positive feedback, to impress other people, to be liked, to say things, maybe not because you think they're true, but because you think it'll uh, raise your status in your political movement. Those temptations are going to be really hard to overcome. And so we don't think there's anything new about human psychology. What's new is that humans on a scale never before seen are able to talk to people. I mean, before, you know, hundreds, even just a hundred years ago, you'd have to go stand on a street corner and like convince people to listen to you or like maybe be a, a preacher or a politician to have an audience. Each of us now at the touch of, you know, our fingers has an audience greater than any of our ancestors could have ever imagined the common person to have. And so, it's so much easier for each of us to grandstand. It's also just easier to find it. So you can log on and just scroll through Twitter and see and probably see a bunch of grandstanding. If you spent 20 minutes on, on Twitter today, you're probably going to see it. And so um, social media and mass mo question allowed it easier for us to act on these desires for status, act on these desires to impress others. And it's also made it just much easier to find it. Just to, to interject uh, with, with one uh, optimistic note. So you might think about this, that, oh, well, uh, you know, society has, has finally introduced some technology that human beings just can't use. There's just no way we can live together uh, with, you know, with uh, this, these easy platforms for, for grandstanding. So we're just inevitably always going to be at each other's throats. So let me give you some reason not, not to think that. Um, I think it's plausible that this is just a case uh, where the norms have not caught up uh, with uh, the social environment yet. Uh, so here's, a, here's an example. If you look at medieval uh, etiquette guides or, or etiquette guides from, from the Middle Ages. Uh, you'll see authors writing for adults who can read and like not only read, they can afford books and there's a reason for them to buy books about etiquette. Uh, the advice is, is stuff like don't gnaw on a bone and then like put it back on the serving dish. Don't blow your nose into the tablecloth, right? So st stuff that if anyone ever told me this, I don't remember because it seems so obvious, like to these people, th this was like, whoa, I mean, we need a whole book to explain stuff like this to us. Uh, so what happened? Well, the norms caught up, right? So here's a case where, you know, maybe people did not have uh, opportunities to blow their nose that often, or they were mostly eating outside or, or in, you know, not not refined settings. Um, and then all of a sudden they, they have these, these opportunities to, to gratify themselves and satisfy these strong urges. Um, so they did, uh, but people don't do that anymore. And the reason they don't do those things anymore is because the norms caught up. Uh, so what Brandon and I hope is that eventually the norms will catch up uh, for grandstanding also. And people will, will come to see it, you know, when someone gets on uh, Facebook or, or Twitter or leaves a, a long caption on Instagram uh, about whatever uh, social justice or, or whatever issue they want to impress people with their moral bona fides about, uh, this will come to be seen as, as gauche. Uh, it's just not the sort of thing that people do uh, in, in polite company. I 
I'm interested in the practical applications you guys imagine for the this book, for the ideas that are set out in it, particularly because I can see a tension in how they're applied. The The first way is going back to our, our mens rea discussion, that there's a self-assessment, like having this taxonomy in front of you, understanding what grandstanding is, makes it easier for you to recognize when you're doing it. But the other way is call it like other diagnosis. So those of us who had the experience of living in undergrad with a roommate who was a psych major hmm. know that that roommate would come home from class and immediately just diagnose you and everyone he knew with all manner of mental illnesses based on you know whatever the lecture had been that day. And I can see something similar happening with this, that you know anytime anyone does any moral talk, someone could say, oh, well, that's an example of piling on or that's an example of trumping up. So what do you see, I guess, as, as you know, the, the reader reads this, what do you expect them to do with it? And ideally, what would you like them to do with it? So the, the entire last chapter of the book is, um, it's, well, it's called What to Do About Grandstanding. And um, this is actually a hard, <laughs> hard to do as a couple of philosophers. We're not, I mean, not in the business of telling people how to, how to live their lives. Um, so what to do about grandstanding? I mean, grandstanding is a very tricky phenomenon because, you know, as you rightly note, uh, it's not something that you can just read off of someone's text. You can't just look at a piece of text often and know whether someone is grandstanding or at least be certain enough to justify a public accusation. In this way, grandstanding is kind of like kind of like lying or demagoguery or bullshit or um, humble bragging. So, you know, it it's it's often not clear whether someone is doing it or not. So what do we do to solve this problem? Well, one thing we argue in this last chapter is that we think that it's not a good idea to call people out for grandstanding. Even if you think someone's doing it, calling someone out for doing this is probably not a good idea. There's several reasons we give. One of them is and it's an epistemic reason. And, that, and it's just simply, you probably don't have enough information to justify a public accusation. And then this leads into a moral reason. So to, because you don't know enough about this person's intentions and goals, you it's probably unfair to them to make a public accusation. And then there's also a, a very practical reason not to call someone a grandstander or accuse them. And that's because that's going to be counterproductive. I mean, we're going to I'm going to accuse you, Aaron, of being a grandstander. And then you'll say, oh, Brandon, you're just grandstanding at me. And then we're going to get an argument about what's in my heart and what's in your heart. And that's the the first time that conversation um uh, well, the next time that kind of conversation is productive will be the first time. It's just not a way to have a good conversation. So we just don't think that calling people out is a good idea. So what do we do? Um, well, what we want to do is change the norm. So we want to go from a norm where grandstanding is common and accepted and even rewarded to a norm where people don't do it. They know better to treat public discourse this way, and uh, they're not impressed by other people's grandstanding. So how do we do that? Well, there's here we, we draw on some work from Christina Bicchieri at the University of Pennsylvania. And the basic idea here is, one, um, set a good example. Uh, set a good example in how we each engage in public discourse. And that means, you know, admitting when you're wrong, uh, paying attention to the data and the evidence, um, understanding that being outraged or expressing anger is not an argument. Um, being harder on yourself than you are on other people. It's easier to, to treat ourselves with grace and think we're great and then be really critical of others. But I think public discourse calls for a division of labor. We should, we should be harder on ourselves, more critical of ourselves than of others. There's lots of tips and tricks we, we talk about in the book for how to avoid grandstanding. Um, so then you might think, okay, well, suppose I stop grandstanding. That's just the drop in the bucket. How do we get other people to stop too if we're unable to call them out? How do we do that? And um, our advice here is to be withholding. <laughs> it's um, so instead of calling someone out for grandstanding, if you suspect someone is grandstanding, uh, don't give them what they seek. Right. So imagine writing a very detailed, passionate, uh, 
you know, criticism of something, you know, Oberlin College for serving, you know, General South chicken or whatever, you know, whatever the case is. And, and you're really trying to show people that you care about this issue and you're really morally important. And then no one responds. Like no one likes it. No one says, you know, OMG, you're so brave. Thank you. Um, if no one does that, at least for most of us, it's going to be embarrassing. And so we think that one way to change the norms uh, to disincentivize self-centered moral talk is to, if you think you see it, avoid it, right? Try to make, um, just like gnawing on a bone at a dinner table would now be embarrassing. Try to make self-centered, egoistic public discourse something a thing of the past by making it something embarrassing to engage in. So we found uh, that, I mean, a lot of people are often dissatisfied with various parts of the book, but I think maybe uh, this is, the thing that people who are friendly to, to the project are, are least satisfied with because they want to get those grand standards that they don't like being told that uh, they shouldn't go after them. Uh, so here, here's what I tell people when they, uh, when they say this, um, remember why we're here, right? Remember what public moral discourse is for and remember why grandstanding is bad, right? So the point of public moral discourse, is to figure out what's true about what we ought to do and, and then to get people to do uh, what we ought to do. So if you go around pointing out when people are grandstanding and, and you know trying to embarrass them like explicitly about it, in a way, you are giving the grandstander exactly what he or she wants. You're letting them make public moral discourse about themselves. So even if it did work, right? And, and some people came came to see them as as a joke uh, or whatever. Uh, you'd still be uh, doing exactly what they're doing, and, and that is making moral talk about the wrong thing. Well, thank you for that that answer. We're starting to run a little low on time, so I think it's time to move into audience Q and A. Um, our first first question has been asked actually by a couple of people, um, a Matthew and a couple of anonymous commentators ask how anonymity affects these grandstanding expressions. Um, we can see perhaps that both the costs and payoffs of grandstanding would be lessened if you were speaking anonymously. Yeah, that's a really nice question. Also, thanks everyone for watching Matt and everyone named Matt and not named Matt. We think thanks for thanks for joining us today. So, yeah, it's uh, so anonymity does change the story a little bit, but we think not by much. So, if you think about yourself typing on the internet, whether you have a name attached to it or not, it's not like some random stranger, right? Is knows who you are, even if you're using a name, even if you're using your real name. Um, and so the fact that you might not attach your identity to your statement to a random stranger is not going to make any difference. I mean, here's what the grandstander is often thinking, and it's often not very sophisticated. What they're thinking is, I'm going to say this thing, and I want the people to see this, to think that the person who wrote this is morally impressive. Now, it's true they can't parade around and take credit for it under their name. That's right. Um, but they're still thinking to themselves, I want to be seen as a certain kind of person, even if all of my audience is thinking is, oh, man, the person who wrote that thing is like really awesome. And of course, when you're the grandstander, all that might all that you might care about is just the uh, the other people think the person who wrote it, which happens to be you and you know it's you. Is really impressive and that might be satisfying to you as 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 much as anything else the other thing to keep in mind is as we mentioned earlier a lot of a lot of impression management impression management is this term that psychologists use where we uh try to get other people to believe that we're the way that we think we are say morally impressive a lot of impression management is reflexive so it's turned back on ourselves so it's they they call this self self-impression management. So, so the basic idea is that a lot of grandstanding might be done with an eye to impressing ourselves as, as strange as that might seem or convincing ourselves that we're good or taking sort of satisfaction and sort of smug satisfaction in our own moral greatness. 
So it's it's true that um, I mean politicians, you know, it doesn't it doesn't mean much for them to incentivize or to grandstand anonymously. But for lots of people, they can still get the kick. They can still get the satisfaction of the desire to just have people think that whoever wrote this thing is morally impressive. That's a good question. We've got uh, another one from uh, Nathaniel Snow who asks, is there a correlation between the scope of issues up for public debate and the intensity of grandstanding? If grandstanding is social rent seeking, higher expected payoff for winning will motivate more grandstanding, right? Let's see. Justin, you want to take that one? Uh, I think I, so I thought it was about two different things, right? So on the one hand, there is the scope of the issues. And then there, there is the bit about rent seeking and, and how much is, is at stake. Um, well, so, so let me, let me try this. Um, grandstanders uh, are in a way sort of entrepreneurial, uh, right? So one way that, that you can Grandstand is to uh, do what, what Brandon mentioned earlier, and it's in our field guide, uh, is to trump up uh, moral concerns. So uh, in other words, uh, there is uh, status to be had for people who are especially sensitive and, and can, um, can find uh, moral problems where, uh, where other people see nothing. So the, the, the thought is uh, that, you know, if you uh, you know, could, could spot uh, this problem that everyone else overlooked, uh, then you must be like morally special somehow. You must be especially sensitive or, uh, you know, especially morally wise uh, or something like that. Uh, so if that's right, uh, then we should expect people to, uh, to do more of this when, when they're grandstanding, right? To look for uh, these kind of hyper-specialized and, and uh, heretofore unrecognized uh, issues. So you might think also, uh, so maybe this is what Nathaniel was, was getting at with a bit about rent seeking, uh, that the more, uh, the more payoff there is for this kind of behavior, um, you know, just straightforwardly thinking of people as, as rational actors, uh, the more of it we would uh, expect to see. Um, so that's reason, you know, if we think this is not ideal behavior, uh, if we think it it's, uh, is not a good use of moral talk or a good outcome to have lots of people uh, lo lobbing uh, exotic uh, or, or recently invented uh, um, claims and, and, and blaming one another for, for violating them, uh, then we, we want to uh, also maybe give people a little bit less credit for behaving this way. Our, our next question comes from uh, Joe Cobb asking how we can best respond to expressions of grandstanding and wondering whether a suppression of response would be sufficient. The idea as he proposes it is that one might listen to a grandstander in silence and not give them any indication of whether you approve of what they've said or not. How would we imagine this as a general response affecting attempts at grandstanding. Yeah, so this is a nice, this is a very nice practical question. Thanks um, for the question. Uh, so we, we do give some advice in the book about how to respond to grandstanding in general. I think, I don't think we address this question in particular. Like if someone says something like that you think is grandstanding, what should you say in response? Um, we're doing a lot of social science with um, a psychologist named Joshua Grubbs. Uh, so far, we've we've done several studies with several thousand participants. And one of the things we want eventually to get to is to try to figure out what kinds of interventions um, are uh, effective, um, but also respectful in, in dealing with, with grandstanding UC. So I'm going to say all that to say that this is an open empirical question, and I, and I want to be sensitive to, you know, sort of empirical interventions and what might actually work. Um, one thing I, I, I suspect sort of 
maybe a little a priori is is helpful in these kinds of conversations is to is to try to gently move the convert the topic of conversation away from the speaker, um, whether it's me challenging the grandstander or the grandstander herself, to try to take the conversation away from it being personal, to not make it personal. This is not about whether you care about the poor. It's not whether I care about the poor. It's about well the issue. Okay, so what what are the relevant issues? So one thing you could do to ask a grandstander is, could you reframe the question for me? Um, could you tell me about the the moral principle that you have um, in mind here what's the what's the relevant moral principle or let's think about the kinds of negative consequences that might come from this proposal or do you have any good data that you could share with me about this question now i'm not promising any of those things are actually going to work but i i do have the suspicion that sort of gently and kindly moving away from personal attacks um personal self-promotion, moving away from those topics and making it about, as it were, the issue at hand, um, I suspect that might be a helpful way to do it. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, these are empirical questions and, and we're engaged in a, in a very uh, long-term empirical problem. Um, what kinds of interventions might actually be helpful? And, and one, I think we have time for one more question, um, this time coming from, I suppose, the side of a, a potential grandstander, someone named Mike, who's a little worried about this. If someone is using moral language to signal their moral views to encourage wider norm changes, is this motivation distinct from what motivates grandstanding? What moral introspection would you recommend for someone considering expressing moral views online in support of a cause? Great question. Uh, so one, you know, we don't actually get that many questions from, from people about uh, how they can avoid grandstanding themselves. Uh, people are usually more interested uh, in, in how they can, they can get those annoying grandstanders that they, they want to go after. So I, I really like this question. Uh, so one test that uh, Brandon and I propose in, in the book is, is what we call the disappointment test. Uh, so you, you, know, you can ask yourself, um, you know, suppose I, I, I type up this post um, or I say this thing at, at you know, this, this rally or, or whatever, uh, and I you know, find out later, no one cared at all about me, right? I got no social credit for it. Nobody was impressed. Nobody thinks better of, of me at all. Uh, ask yourself, would you be disappointed? Uh, and, and if the answer is yes, that's good evidence that maybe you care a little bit too much, uh, at least in this one instance, uh, about what this instance of, of moral talk would be doing for you uh, and, and maybe not enough about what it would do for other people uh, who, who moral talk is, is supposed to be helping. Now, you know, look, it could be that you just happen to be, be in a case where it's so important that, uh, that, that someone say something, right? Uh, that even if you're grandstanding, it's still... The right thing to do, um, but you should even in that case, I think, go in knowing that you know what you're doing is is not optimal, right? It, it would be better uh, if you weren't motivated uh, to to seek you know status for yourself, and and if if you were uh, primarily just just going uh, for helping others. But it's good to ask, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Justin's right that that I mean one thing we didn't point out yet, but that we discuss in the book is that is that some it might be okay in some cases to grandstand. I mean I think we're per, we're perfectly comfortable with that. I mean grandstanding is maybe no different than lying in this respect. I, mean, I think most moral philosophers would say sometimes it's okay to lie. That doesn't mean it's like great or choice worthy or laudable, but it might be the best of a set of maybe bad options. And so the thought is not that grandstanding is always everywhere not to be done, although we shouldn't be giving ourselves too much license to do it. There may be cases in which just, it's, it's just the thing to do. You just have to do it. What we argue in the book is that there's a strong presumption, just like there's a strong presumption against lying or maybe bragging. Or there's a strong moral presumption against grandstanding. And so it, here's the thought. If you can do all of your advocacy and activism and protesting, those are all wonderful things. But 
if you can do them without trying to seek for yourself status, you're going to be more morally above board and probably more effective than if you're trying to seek status for yourself and trying to make moral discourse, moral progress, a vanity project. Well, I think that's a, an excellent note to, to end on. Um, we have more questions, but unfortunately we've, we've run out of time for today. Um, Justin and Brandon, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, thank you to all of our viewers for watching. The book that we've discussed today is Grandstanding, The Use and Abuse of Moral Talk, and it's available in print today, so you can find it on, on Amazon, on Oxford, anywhere else you like to find books. Um, and there will be additional materials posted on this, this event page and a recording of this lecture. So thank you again to all of our guests and our audience, and have a wonderful afternoon.